morning to everyone. The project, The Sacred Landscape of Travel Naga, is part of my PhD thesis affiliated to the University of Liverpool and is entitled Developmental Landscape of the Sacred Space at Travel Naga, a case study within the Theban necropolis. I would like to underline that this is an ongoing research, and as a result, the data and results shown here today are provisional, since I am still working on the processing to, uh, of the collected data. In this presentation, I will firstly introduce the project, the methodological approach, and the working hypothesis. Secondly, I will describe the three analyses applied to the research area using a group of Ramesite tombs from Drabu el Naga South as a case study. Finally, the tomb of Yehuti, TT11, located at the northern area, will be used as an example <coughs> sorry, to supplement the distribution of the territory analysis. The end of this project is to study the sacred landscape of the southern area and the beginning of the northern of Trabu el Naga and its evolution from the 18th to the 20th dynasties. The project is focused on the spatial development of these areas, where the analysis of the topographical elements together with the geomorphological, architectural and archaeological changes that Trabu el Naga encounter throughout the New Kingdom will help us to explain how the distribution of the territory took place. GIS studies will investigate the cultural, sociopolitical, and religious background, which also played an important role in the distribution of the territory as the cornerstone linking them all. The methodological approach adopted derives from the theories relating to landscape archaeology. What landscape archaeology suggests is an approach to the spatial reality of ancient populations from different perspectives sorry, perspectives, thus defining landscape in a more holistic and relational sense, including pieces of evidence that due to their characteristics are closer to the symbolic and conceptual milieu. In this sense, landscape archaeology considers a space not as a mere physical entity, but as a symbolic co construction, a semiological system in which the activities of a community acquire meaning and it is not considered as a simple, passive stage for the human action. My working hypothesis is based on the assumption that the choice of the place where a tomb chapel was to be located was not made by chance. We should discern whether it is possible to speak about a planned tomb chapel placement and therefore a planned topographical layout. Among the criteria for the location of a tomb, it is important to have the following aspect in mind. The size of the tomb, chap, sorry, the size of the tomb and the quality of the rock, and its relation to the status of the owner. The clustering of tomb chapels due to family or professional links. Visibility connection from the tomb chapels to the mortuary and cult temples. Determining whether the orientation of the tomb chapels is related to the processional weights and natural routes. Therefore, this is a multidisciplinary project in which the area of Drabu el Naga and its position within the Theban funerary context will be studied as a sacred space with a complete meaning. Now, I will turn to the case study that will, I hope, illustrate this what this project aim to achieve. The case study I'm presenting to you today is located in the southern area of Trabu el Naga, where a clustering of 18 tombs dated to the Ramesside period is clearly visible. This group of tombs is displayed here as an example of the, of the methodology applied in our research area, including 109 tomb chapels. These tombs have been chosen to be studied as a group, since all of them are located in an area of Trabu el Naga which is not saturated, and they are very close to each other in a limited space. In this sense, the placement of these tombs individually and as a group suggests that their location was not a matter of chance and that different criteria had to be present in the choice of this place. They also have representative architectural elements uh, in common, such as the Macbeth pyramid superstructures, which crown some of these tombs, 
and the large courtyards. In this project, we propose to apply three different but complementary analyses to this group of tombs uh, of Trabuel Naga. First of all, it is crucial to carry out an analysis of the tombs from an archaeological and architectural point of view. The study is focused on the external parts of the tomb chapels in order to survey how they developed through the New Kingdom, since this modifies our vision of the necropolis and the landscape. Our aim, therefore, is to acquire an exhaustive image of the necropolis in each chronological period, in each dynasty, and, if possible, during each reign. Studying the external parts of the tombs, their courtyards, facades, and superstructures will bring us closer to the ancient Egyptian vision of the necropolis. These features can also be very helpful to reconstruct the building, the building order of these tombs. Let us exemplify this by analyzing the aforementioned clustering of the 18 Ramesside tombs. We can see that TT 282 was built before TT 283, since the pyramid superstructure of TT 283 is out of place of the main axis of the tomb, as it is the main pattern of the rest of the tombs of the same characteristics, overlapping and partly destroying the pyramid superstructure of 282. Similarly, the sloping passage of 283 broke into the one in TT282, which seems to be a miscalculation of the masons when they cut the passage of 283. Therefore, this is a clear evidence that the architectural plan of TT283 was squeezed in between 282 and TT35. However, the building development of the rest of the tomb is more difficult to estimate, but could be explained by turning to archaeology. Thus, it seems that TT288 was built before 289 and TT304, since their structures are adapted within the courtyard and facade of TT288. TT285 seems to have been built attached to the courtyard of TT288, and therefore after 288 and 289. Similarly, TT300, which is dated to the second half of Ramses II, Merneptah, was built when TT-158 was already built since its pyramid is also out of place of the main axis of TT-300. 301 was built after 300, adapted its structure to that of 300. Therefore, it cannot be dated before 20th dynasty. Whether the rock among uh, TT-159 and TT-287 served as a climbing ramp to the courtyard of 300 cannot be proved. However, if this ramp existed before the preparation of the courtyard of TT-300, three, uh, sorry, 159 and 287 should be considered as an attachment to the previous TT-300. This archaeological analysis could be inconclusive without a second type of criteria to supplement it. In this context, a prosopographic and genealogical study of the tomb chapel's owners, with special attention paid to the family, familial and professional relationships between the owners, will be essential. This study will investigate whether social status and kinship relationships played a part in the choice of the place for the location of a tomb, determining whether the tombs of family members were intentionally located according to a special rela a spatial relationship between them, and to ascertain whether or not there is a clustering of tombs or family complexes. In this same group of tombs, for instance, eight of the owners belong to the Amun priesthood. Four are overseers of the Southlands. 
Two, share the titles Viceroy of Kush and Overseer of the Southlands. And three, are Overseers of the Double Treasury. Titles and kinship were important features that link two owners. For instance, the owner of TT157, um, the Bonanef, was appointed as first prophet of Amun during the first year of the reign of Ramses II. Nebuchadnezzar is, is the first owner who held this title in the 18th Ramesside tombs of this group. He is not genealogically linked with any other owner, but the scenes in his tomb prove an individual appointment or reward by the king. And the importance uh, of uh, his office is clear by the location of his tomb and his ownership of a mortuary temple close to the location of, of the temple of Seti I. Likewise, Bagenhons, owner of TT35, succeeded Nebonanef as fir first prophet of Amun. He was in charge. He was in charge of this title from year 44 until year 66 of the reign of Ramses II. He is the first generation of a large and powerful family related with the Amun priesthood. Bagenhons was succeeded by Roma Roy, who is the brother or son of the owner of TT35, who was first prophet of Amun during the reign of Merneptah until the end of the 19th dynasty. From this point onwards, it is difficult to present a lineal order of the placement of these tombs. However, it is useful to present a hypothesis of how this area was distributed and whether there was a plan conceived in advance. To achieve this, I will use the dating of these tombs and the main titles of the owners. Ben Nesutawi, owner of TT156, is the father of Nacht, who is in turn owner of TT282. And they share their two main titles, captain of troops and overseer of the Southlands under Ramses II. Following a chronologically natural order, and having in mind that the titles were inherited, the order of play placement of these tombs, 156 first, TT282 uh, uh, second, could be confirmed. This detail leads us to conclude that 157 and 156 were probably built simul simultaneously, while their heirs built their tombs in the following order. TT35, TT282, and TT283. At this point, it should be discerned why 35 was not built close to 157, and TT282 to 156, sorry, when the available space was not a problem. The fact that 35 was not built closer to his predecessor in TT157 could be due to the fact that 156 was already built. However, this hypothesis does not take into account 156 and 282. As the space close to 156 was available, since is confirmed that TT300 was built later, at the second half of the reign of Ramses II. In order to reach a complete conclusion, the ongoing study of the quality of the rock and the visibility analysis will give us, hopefully, a clue to answer this question, since these tombs are orientated towards different places. I will escape some tombs for the sake of time. Thanks to the family relationship of the owners of these tombs, it has, has been possible to link nine owners of this clustering, four in one group and five owners in another, which are as follows. Bagenhons is the first generation, the owner of TT35. The second one, Roma Roy, who is Bagenhons' brother or his son, I'm like playing with these two possibilities. Raya, who is Roma Roy's grandson. Chanefer, who is the husband of Bagenhon's granddaughter. 
Anne Passer, <coughs> excuse me, who is probably Chanefer's grandson. This kind of a study allow, allows us to state that our working hypothesis of the clustering of tombs following professional and familial links is correct, since all these owners are relatives and prophets of Amun. In the following group, <laughs> the kinship links cannot 100% prove, although the most likely hypothesis makes any owner of TT285 the father-in-law of Raya, Pahemneter, the son of Raya, Penesutawi, the father of Nacht, and father-in-law of Pahemneter. Finally, a study of the distribution of the territory and its connection with other areas of the necropolis and the surrounding religious cultic zones has been done by using a geographical information system as its main tool. Historical maps of the necropolis and satellite images have been used. The main points have been georeferenced, and this information and data are being processed with ArcGIS software. This is an essential tool for a detailed cartography of the area with the tombs located by coordinates, which were non-existent before our fieldwork. The first analysis is a visibility study between Drabu el Naga and the main areas of the Theban necropolis, with the objective of determining whether there are clear lines of visibility between the tombs and the mortuary temples, or with other cult places of interest. In order to perform the visibility analysis, it is essential to have previously carried out a digital elevation model, which will give us the possibility of knowing with a high degree of security whether the visibility was clear between two points. However, the lack of detail and recent maps has meant that we have worked with a differential GPS and a total station to create a microtopography, microtopography of the area with the tombs located by coordinates as a previous stage to generate the DEM. Here, there is a view of the points taken at the topographical survey, more than 10,000, and the provisional map I mentioned before with the location of the tombs. We have created the contour lines from the topographical data I showed you in the previous slide, and we have also recorded the entrances of all the tombs with the GPS to get their exact location by coordinates. In order to construct the DEM, knowledge of the geology and geomorphology of the area is crucial due to the changing nature of its landscape. The geomorphologic study of the area contributes towards specifying whether some elevations are natural to the territory or if they are, in fact, accumulation of debris of the with which the passage of time and human activity in the area have formed. In this sense, it is important to establish the visual aspect of the necropolis during the New Kingdom and the dynamic changes that this area encountered. The main goals of the geological and geomorphological study are the identification of the main lithological and structural characteristics of the rock where the tombs were carved, identification of the different stratigraphic formation in the area such as the Esna and Theban formations, identification of the geological geomorphological units defining the area by previous authors, Three areas can be defined with different geological characteristics. The first one, tabular structure, which are the Esna and Theban formations. The second one, large uh, blocks tilted towards the northwest. And here we will see the mega, mega landslide. And the third one, the no called Northern Basin, which is our study area. Here, you can see the three identified areas. Once these identifications were completed, we worked on the preparation of a geological, geomorphological, evolutionary model that you can see here as a sketch. Also, the study of the stratigraphic column of the geological levels is essential 
since the quality of the rock could have been one of the reasons to determine the tomb's placement. Here, you can see an example of the stratigraphic column in the tomb of Yehuti, TT11. The second goal is the reconstruction of the original surface and its development through time. The identification of the ancient level of uh, the landscape will help us to create a preliminary geomorphological model of the area. The discovery of a geomorphological specific and unequal feature with geospatial continuation to help us to identify the original surface survey was one of the main objectives, and I have to admit one of the more difficult. The main problem was the high degree of anthropic transformation in the necropolis. However, we were able to identify the more reliable feature, the Salmon Peak level, which marks the previous surface to the construction of the tombs. Once these landforms were created, the mega landslide we saw before, a salmon peak surface developed and it has been taken as a guide surface for reconstructing the landscape of Trabuel Naga during the New Kingdom. In order to reconstruct the original surface of Trabuel Naga South, we are working with a sequence of surfaces, as you can see here. This is a digital elevation model based on the geological points recorded during survey, where the salmon pink level was identified. And this is a reconstruction of the geological surface previous to the carving of the tombs. The second one is a DEM of the Theban Necropolis map surveyed in 1921 by the Survey of Egypt. And finally, this is a DEM of the current terrain, including the tombs and the anthropic mounds. Using the three surfaces and discriminating the unnecessary information, such as the debris from all excavations, modern buildings, and debris from the demolition of the old town houses, we will reach the final approach approximation to the new kingdom surface. Unfortunately, I cannot show you today the last approach, however, since this study is still in progress. Here you can see an example of the pre preliminary digital elevation model, which needs to be improved, but where it's already possible to identify some of the tomb courtyards and entrances catching the rock. This DEM will be used for the visibility analysis. The second analysis to be applied to the distribution of the territory of Trabuel Naga is the reconstruction of the ancient paths and processional routes with a view to establishing an explanation for this site's layout. In the necropolis, there must have been an intense traffic of people going to and returning from the cemetery and funerary processions that could have required complex facilities, such as paths, roads, canals, harbors, to ensure access to the necropolis. The processional routes are very important since they were the link between the cold temples on the East Bank and the mortuary temples and the necropolis on the West Bank. These routes are well identified on the East Bank between the temples of Luxor and Karnak, as all of you know. However, it is difficult to know exactly what, what the itinerary was on the West Bank, mainly in the private necropolis areas. One may assume that the only way to have a better understanding of the distribution could be a complete excavation of the area. However, the use of GIS enables us to make a hypothesis with regard to the layout. The results of the current excavations in the area have to be used for this analysis. For example, in the upper part of the tomb of Yehuti, TT11 in Drabul Naga North, there is an example of the remains of stairs which connected to paths uh, or roads, one level of tombs with the upper one. Here you can see a reconstruction and a plan of the three levels of tombs with the path in the middle. Another important, important aspect to have in mind is that among the 14 tombs dated from the corrigency of Hatshepsut to Moses III, 
Nine of them are located in Sha Sheikh Abdel Gurna, one in Deir el-Bahari, two in Hoja, and two in Drab el Naga North. Among the, the 36 tombs dated from the reign of Tumosi III, 24 of them are also located in Sheikh Abdel Gurna, four in Hoja, four in Drab el Naga South, and four in Drab el Naga North. Not all the tombs are located here, but this is just to show you some as an example. It could be said that the principal dignitaries at this time built their tombs southwest of the mortuary temple of the queen or close to the funerary temple of Tumosi III. However, Nebamun, Intef, Usar, and TT262 in the southern area, and Jehuti, Intef, Baki, Montuher Hepeshef, and Nebamun in the northern area placed their two chapels across the valley of Deir el Bahari. Why did they move away from their colleagues? Why did they choose that particular place? Concerning the religious aspect, Drabul Naga North is located just opposite the temple of Amun in Karnak. The Amun procession in the be beautiful feast of the valley could have crossed the river in this part of the necropolis to start its itinerary through the different mortuary temples of the West Bank. This is the example of Jehuti, who worked in Karnak as an overseer of the treasury, an overseer of the works, and was probably the first to change the location of his tomb far from Deir el Bahari. In this case, a direct visual connection between his tomb and the temple of Karnak could be assumed. To sum up, modern scholarship has mainly focused on specific areas or single tomb chapels, while little attention has been paid to the landscape or the spatial distribution of the tombs. To accomplish a complete, a complete study of the necropolis, it is crucial to draw attention to the aspect of the necropolis as a whole, in which tomb chapels, mortuary temples, and processional ways are interconnected with the topographical and geographical landscape. We expect to achieve a wider understanding of the necropolis and its appearance as a sacred space. Thank you.